So now let's look at two applications of the camera under pure rotation. The first application that we are going to look at would be to generate uh, what we call the synthetic views. Suppose that we are given a source image of a corridor, and we know that this uh, corridor contains of multiple planes, for example, the floor plane that we can see over here. So what we, the objective of generating synthetic view would be to map this particular source image into a target image where the plane of interest, for example, this ground plane over here, would become uh, frontal parallel to the target image plane. And we know that since the world uh, scene that we are interested in, it consists of a plane, and this plane is being projected onto the image, and we have seen that uh, the projection is equivalent to a homography. That means that the warping of this can be done with a planar homography H, which is equivalent to pure rotation. Similarly, we can uh, select another plane of interest, for example, this wall plane over here. We can select this wall plane over here and then map it and warp it such that this wall plane becomes frontal parallel to the target image under uh, another homography, which is equivalent to a pure rotation as we have what we have seen earlier on. Let's look at the algorithm to achieve this. The first step of this algorithm is simply to compute, uh, given a source image, suppose that this is my source image and uh, this is my target image that I want to unwatch. So given a source image, I would have to first identify the quadrilateral shape of the plane in this particular source image. And from here, I will be able to identify the four vertices of this uh, quadrilateral uh, shape that is in the source image. And the objective here is that I want to find the homography such that I can map this particular uh, quadrilateral uh, shape from the source image into a perfect rectangle of a certain predefined aspect ratio. So this means that I need to define the aspect ratio, the desired aspect ratio uh, of this warping. We can see that we have four point correspondences from the source image with the target uh, image. And this is related by a homography. And we have seen in lecture, earlier on in lecture three that every point, uh, let's call the target one point here on the target image as x prime and the source image, uh, the corresponding point as x. We have seen that x prime is essentially equals to h multiplied by x. And uh, with four such correspondences, we can solve for h using the linear method that we have seen in lecture three. Uh, once we have computed the H, what we can do here is that uh, since we have the source image and we want to warp it into the target image, we know that the relation between this is a homography. Just now we denote this as X and X prime, every pixel here and every pixel here as X. So we know that uh, pretty much X prime equals to H uh, multiplied by X. And what we can do uh, since H is already computed in the first step over here. What we can do to transform every pixel from the source image to get the target image will be simply to compute the lookout table by simply doing this transformation here, inverse of X prime. So uh, every pixel here, I have the pixel coordinate. I can simply input it into X prime. And then with the known H uh, homography, I can compute the corresponding location in the source image. And by doing this, I will be able to look out for the corresponding RGB value in the source image and fill it up uh, in the target image. And hence, I'll be able to uh, warp the source image into the target image uh, as given by the homography. Uh, the next application that we're going to look at uh, from pure camera rotation would be the example of planar panoramic uh, mosaicing. Suppose that we are given uh, several images that is taken by a camera that undergoes pure rotation. So it's only going undergoing pure rotation. And we know that uh, earlier on from uh, what we have seen, that these images, every point correspondences of these images, uh, any pair of these images, they are actually related by a homography. 
So suppose that this point and this point, because of a fixed camera center, and it only under the images only undergoes a pure rotation. These two points, suppose I call this x prime and x over here. So these two point x prime is, is in fact equals to h multiplied by x, which is a planar homography. And we'll see how from these three images that I have taken of the scene, I can create a panoramic image. That means that I'm going to stitch these three images out to co create a panoramic view of the scene. And here's an example. Suppose that I give you all together eight images that is taken under pure rotation. I'll be able to uh, make one of the image. For example, uh, say this, this, this particular image here as my reference image. So if this is my uh, reference image, I can pretty much compute the homography of every other image with respect to this image and make use of this image as a reference frame and simply warp all the other images uh, into the reference frame to get the panoramic uh, image that looks like this. So let's see how this can be done. As I, as I have mentioned earlier on, we can choose any one of the images. Suppose that we are given uh, five images, for example. So I1, I2, I3, I4, as well as I5. Suppose that I choose I3 as my reference image. What I can do here is that I can detect four point correspondences uh, from I2 and to I3. And then I can compute the homography that brings me from uh, two to three for example. I'll be able to projectively warp this image to into the reference frame. I can actually create a larger image. But I'm going to fix this the reference of I3 in the as the reference frame on this particular image. After I compute the homography to warp I2 into the reference frame of I3, I'll be able to check for every pixel here, for example, because this undergoes rotation. So uh, it would be the, the image, the image seen that is seen in this image would be outside the field of view of I3. So, but what I can do here is that I can actually compute every pixel here via H2, the homography of uh, H2 to H3. And then uh, I will be able to look up uh, from every pixel here, suppose I call this pixel here uh, H prime, and I know, let's say H prime is related to X. Uh, so suppose that X prime is related to H and X via this relation here we, that we have seen. Let's say the points on I2 is denoted by X, and the warping of I2 onto the reference frame is denoted by X prime. For every pixel of X prime over here, I'll be able to compute the corresponding uh, location on X on image 2 and then I'll be able to create a lookout table to look up every RGB value here to fill in to this reference frame. So I can do this pretty much for all the images. Let's say in this case here I'm going to compute H4 uh, that is relating uh, H4 and H3 uh, and then do the same step and warp the, all the pixels on I4 onto the reference image that is shown here. For images that are further away from I3, for example, I5, if there is still an overlapping field of view, I can pretty much take four point correspondence and compute the homography from five to three. But what if in, in, in the case where uh, in the case where this direct correspondence from I3 to I5 is not possible, uh, this means that the, they do not share overlapping field of view anymore. You can just imagine that you are rotating the camera and I3 might be looking in front of the camera, but I5 might be looking at the side of the camera where the views in the two images might not share any overlapping scene. So in this particular case, the computation of uh, H, the homography that relates the fifth image to the third image would not be possible anymore. But what we can do here is that we can simply compute the homography using any four point correspondence between image four and five. This will be bringing an image point from the fifth image onto the fourth image. And then uh, by once I have this uh, homography that is being computed, I can easily compute uh, since homography is a linear mapping. Uh, so what this means is that the linear relation 
exist. So this means that uh, I can easily compute uh, the homography of 5 to 3 and th that this, e this would be equals to simply the homography of 4 to 3 multiplied by the homography of 5 to 4. So this linear relation uh, works here. And what it simply means is that if I have a point uh, in image 5 uh, that I call x prime, for example, and an uh, image point that is an i3 x, the image point in x, uh, which is in i3, would be simply given by the homography that brings the point x prime to in image 5 to x3. And this can be simply uh, written in the linear chain of transformation, which is uh, given by this computation over here. And we simply have to do this for every pair of images that is referencing to i3. Uh, for example, i2 to i3, uh, i1 to i3, and i4 to i3, and i5 to i3. So once we have the all computed all the homographies that relates every other image to the reference image, we can pretty much compute the lookup table and such that we can map every pixel from other images onto the reference frame uh, in order to get this particular panoramic uh, image over here. Now, let's move on to look at what does the knowledge of a camera uh, calibration uh, gives us. So what this means is that what is, this is simply referring to the intrinsic value, the knowledge of the intrinsic value which we have saw that this 3x3 three three, uh, K matrix. So if this is known, there are several things that, that can be deduced directly from uh, this known uh, intrinsic value and on the points, image points that is uh, identified on a single image. So suppose that we denote, let us, let us denote the points on a ray that is given by this inhomogeneous coordinate of a, a 3D point. So suppose that this is my 3D point and uh, this is the camera center. So this is the light ray that intersects the image plane on this 3D point. Suppose that I denote the direction of this light ray as uh, lambda d, or uh, the, what this simply means is that this is the inhomogeneous coordinate of this. Uh, uh, this so this is equals to x, y, z, and one. So what I'm doing here is that I'm taking the first read value and denoting, denoting it as a vector uh, of d and uh, assigning it uh, with lambda. This simply means that I turn this into a whole family of uh, points that is lying on this light ray. So now let's denote this uh, light ray, a uh, whole family of points that is lying on the light ray as x tilde. And we know that uh, from what we have seen earlier on that this uh, the, the, this whole family of points, they are all going to be projected onto the image at this particular point, which we call small x. And this is simply given by uh, the equation that we have looked at many times. Uh, it, it goes to the projection matrix multiplied by the 3D point x, and which can be rewritten as uh, into the intrinsic and extrinsic. So here, the extrinsic is identity. This means that uh, we are treating the camera at a canonical uh, location where the camera coordinate aligns with the uh, world frame. And then we are going to multiply by the homogeneous coordinates of the, this light ray or this particular point that is denoted by lambda d transpose and 1. So this is essentially the ray that joins the camera center, the, the image coordinate, as well as the 3D point, because there's a zero here. So multiplying this here simply gives us uh, the intrinsic value, um, the 3x3 three three intrinsic, multiplied by the 3x1 uh, directional vector of the 3D point. Uh, what this means is that all the points in this direction are going to be projected onto the same image point which you denote by x. So conversely, uh, if we were to take the inverse of this guy, since we know that small x equals to k multiplied by d now, and k here, unlike the camera projection matrix, is actually an upper triangular matrix, an uh, upper triangular 3x3 three three matrix that is invertible. So what this simply means is that we can do the reverse. We can invert this guy here to get the direction of the light ray. And this would be simply equals to k inverse of x over here. And what this means is that just from the knowledge of the camera intrinsics and given a 2D coordinate point on the image, we'll be able to express the light ray, the 
mathematical equation of the light ray as well as we'll also be able to uh, say for example the converse uh, so we, we if we know the direction of this guy we'll also be able to find the projection onto the particular uh, image point uh, a further application of this is we can actually use this knowledge to find the true angle between two uh, points in the world as illustrated here so suppose that in the real world that I have a point which I call x1 and I have another point which I call x2 over here and what I want to do here is that given a camera I want to find the angle that is defined by the light ray that joins x1 to c and light ray that joins x2 to c and we know that we can actually observe these two 3d points on the image which we denote by small x1 and small x2 so from what we have seen earlier on that the direction d1 is simply given by the inverse of the camera multiplied by x1 and the direction of d2 is simply given also by the inverse of the camera intrinsics multiplied by x2 over here the angle would be simply the dot product between the two directional uh, vector which is given by this guy over here what we have here it would be d1 uh, transpose d2 which is the dot product and this is simply equals to the magnitude of d1 multiplied by the magnitude of d2 multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the two light ray and this by moving the magnitude across we can see that the cosine of the angle is simply given by the dot product of the two directions divided by the magnitude of the two directions which is given by this guy over here if we were to substitute the direction vector that we have found earlier on with respect to the camera intrinsics and the image point yeah, back into this particular uh, cosine uh, relation over here this essentially gives us this particular uh, equation over here in terms of the image point and the uh, camera intrinsics and we can further simplify this expression into uh, this particular expression here what is this simply means is that if a camera is calibrated we can actually use it to measure the angle between uh, any two corresponding image point and this is equivalent to the angle between any two 3d points in the real scene uh, that's what we have seen earlier on so as a result we can also think of it this way that a calibrated camera is actually a directional sensor it acts like a 2d protractor that allows us to measure uh, the angle between any two points x1 and x2 we can also further uh, use the knowledge of the unknown camera matrix to define the normal direction of a plane that results from a back projection of a 2d line the normal direction of this plane is simply given by the transpose of the camera intrinsics uh, multiplied by L and uh, let's look at the proof on why is this true suppose that we have a point uh, on uh, that we call X on the 2d line over here and we know that this particular point it backs projects to uh, a light ray which is given by this guy over here from the equation that we have seen earlier on using the known camera intrinsics value and we also know that this particular uh, direction is going to be octagonal to the normal the back projected uh, plane of the line and we know that this normal vector is octagonal to this particular uh, plane that is created by the back projection of the line and what it simply also means is that the ray d over here is going to be octagonal to this particular normal direction and hence the dot product of the light ray and the normal direction of the plane that is created by the back projection of the line it's going to be equals to zero so we can substitute this guy over here uh, in terms of the intrinsic value back into this dot product defined earlier on and this is essentially the equation uh, that we get due to, due to a point and uh, line relation we can also see that uh, here it simply means that x here is lying on a line which is l that is defined by k inverse transpose uh, and and 
that's why the line equation can be re rewritten as uh, k inverse transpose of n whether we can see further that the normal direction here is simply by bringing this k over to the left hand side and uh, that would be equal to k transpose of l which is what we have uh, claimed earlier on and this shows the proof so another thing that we can obtain from uh, a known camera intrinsic value is what we call the image of an absolute conic on a plane at infinity there's a conic and this particular conic is called the absolute conic so by knowing the camera intrinsic value what we're claiming here now is that we'll be able to define the projection of the absolute conics onto the image plane which we call the image of absolute conics that is we'll see that it's denoted by omega over here now let's look at why is this uh, true suppose that we denote this plane at infinity with pi uh, infinity and all the points uh, it can be written as uh, consisting of a set of points a set of infinite point ideal points that is lying on this plane that we denote by x infinity over here and this is simply a collection of all the direction vector on the plane at infinity so the last coordinate over here must be zero and now suppose that this set of uh, ideal points that's lying on the plane at infinity it's being uh, imaged onto a image uh, using a general camera uh, p over here which is denoted by uh, kr and multiplied by i uh, minus c tilde so this is the intrinsics and this is the extrinsics of the camera it's a general camera because the extrinsics value here is no longer identity so suppose we apply this particular uh, projection matrix onto the a set of infinite points that lies on the plane at infinity we will take p multiplied by x infinity substituting all the equations into this uh, expression over here this is what we will get and we will see that uh, the end result would be simply k multiplied by r times uh, d over here and what's interesting here is that we can see that the projection of the ideal points at infinity is actually independent of the camera center or the camera translation in the extreme six this is only dependent on the direction of the ideal points as well as the intrinsics and the rotation of the uh, camera and what's even more interesting here is that since we get this relation of x equals to kr multiplied by d which is simply a three by one vector and three by one vector here, which is simply a P2 projection onto the same space itself. Hence, we can rewrite KR over here, K multiplied by R over here as a homography. So what this also means is that the set of ideal points on the plane of infinity uh, maps onto the image plane uh, via a relation of homography. So this shouldn't come as a surprise uh, result because we all know that homography is a general relation that relates to planes so since x infinity are all the points that lies on the plane at infinity and this is a plane and uh, what this uh, and what we are going to do is that we're going to map this points at infinity uh, onto an image plane which is also a plane so the relation between these two the image plane and the plane at infinity must be a homography and we have seen earlier on that this relation is independent on the camera center it's only dependent on the intrinsics as well as the orientation of the camera so now suppose that we have the absolute conics uh, that lies on the plane at infinity so suppose that this is my absolute conics that lies at infinity what we want to find here is that we want to find the relation of this uh, absolute conics when it's being mapped onto a image plane and the this should also be a conic since it's a 2d conic on a plane mapping onto uh, another entity on the image plane which should also be a 2d uh, conic and we'll see that this particular image of the absolute conic is going to be defined by uh, omega over here which is simply k transpose k multiplied by k transpose inverse uh, and that works out to be 
K inverse transpose multiplied by K. So essentially what this means is that if we know the camera intrinsics, we will be able to find the image conic. The in interesting thing about this image of a conic is that it consists of only imaginary points. Uh, and there's no real points at all. That this means that we cannot physically observe this uh, image of the absolute conic on any image. Nonetheless, we'll see some practical usage of this. For example, a hint here would be, it should become pretty obvious that since the absolute conics is defined by only the camera intrinsics, what it simply means is that if there is a way to find the, the image of the absolute conic, uh, then we will pretty much be able to find the intrinsics of the camera. And this simply means that the image of the absolute conics can be used to calibrate the camera. Before we look at this, let's prove the relation on why is it that uh, omega over here, the image of absolute conics is equals to k multiplied by k transpose in inverse of the whole thing. So uh, we know that under point homography, oh, there's a missing prime over here, under the uh, point homography on one image x here, it's going to be mapped onto another image uh, which we denote by x prime via a homography and that relation is given by x hx equals to x prime which is seen in this equation over here if this particular relation that maps the uh, x into x prime via homography holds true then a conic on the image or conic on the image is also going to map onto a conic on the other image via this particular uh, relation over here. So I'm not going to prove this particular relation because we have seen it earlier on in uh, lecture one. Please refer to lecture one for the proof. What it simply means is if I have a conic on the plane at infinity and this conic is none other than the absolute conic which is denoted by omega infinity, it lies on the plane at infinity, then uh, I also know that this particular conic has a equation is defined by just identity and this is what we have seen uh, earlier on in the previous lecture then this particular conic is also going to be mapped onto the image plane via the same kind of relation and since we know that the absolute conic here is equals to identity and we also know that the homography that relates these two plane is simply given by k r that we have defined earlier on. We can substitute this expression into the transformation of the conics that we have seen earlier on. So essentially, this is my h inverse, and this guy here is equivalent to my c, and this guy here is equivalent to h inverse. So if I multiply this, I'll be able to get the mapping of the absolute conic onto the image of the absolute conic on that on the particular image which I denote as omega over here so since this is identity the conic absolute conic is equals to identity we can further simplify this expression into this expression over here where we see that r multiplied by r inverse cancels out to be identity so what we are left with is simply this equation here which is equals to the image of uh, the absolute conics that we have seen earlier on so a few remarks here on the image of absolute conics is that it actually it only depends on the internal, the intrinsic parameter K of the camera matrix, and it does not depend on the camera orientation or position. So we'll see later that we can actually make use of the, the knowledge of W or omega over here to calibrate the camera to find the unknown uh, intrinsic value. And the second remarks that we can make about the absolute image of the absolute conic is that the angle between two rays that we have seen earlier on can also be expressed with respect to the image of the absolute uh, conics in, in this particular equation over here. We also see that this relation it simply remains unchanged under projective transformation. So this is also true uh, because if I have uh, the, the direction, so what this simply means is I'm going to project this direction, which I denote as D1 and D2 over here. So these are going to intersect on the plane, on the image plane as X1 
and x2. So previously what we have seen is that uh, we have seen that d1 transpose d2 is uh, I'm only looking at the numerator. So d1 transpose d2 is going to be equal to the, the numerator, which is what we have seen earlier on here because this is the direction so d we, we've seen that d1 is e equals to the inverse of k multiplied by x1 and we can substitute this into this expression which further simplify into this expression over here the the proof uh, that is that we can see that this term over here now since we have defined the image of absolute cone is indeed equals to omega and hence uh, we will have this particular relation over here so we can further prove that uh, this expression remains unchanged under a projective uh, transformation of an image let's denote this by h for example so uh, let's just look at the numerator term of this so the denominator will follow the same proof so uh, starting from x1 transpose omega x2 so under any uh, general projective transformation of x prime that transform a point x into x prime which we denote by h over here we can see that uh, this guy here it's my x prime and this guy here is my omega prime after transformation and uh, this guy here is my x2 prime sorry this should be x1 prime and since x1 prime is given by h uh, multiplied by x1 prime so the transpose of this guy x1 transpose will simply become x1 transpose multiplied by h transpose and then uh, we know we have seen earlier on that the uh, uh, conics under when it undergone a projective transformation is simply given by h transpose inverse multiplied by the conic and multiplied by h inverse and then uh, similarly for x2 uh, this would directly follow the projective transformation that we have uh, seen here and uh, we can see that all this homography all this h over here the projective transformation actually cancels off and uh, it will still give us the original uh, equation and hence this shows that the angle between any two ray that is defined by the image of absolute conics is invariant to any form of projective transformation a third remark that can be made on the image of the absolute conic is directly obtained from the result of remark 2 that we have seen earlier on so the uh, in the case where the two points x1 and x2 are octagonal this simply means that i will have a cosine 90 degree and that's equals to zero so the new denominator that we have seen here would uh, cancels off when this guy here equals to zero so, and this would be the relation that we have Another re, uh, remark that we can make on the image of absolute conics is that uh, we can also define the dual image of the absolute conics. So uh, as we have seen earlier on in lecture one, that a co the dual of a conics C star over here is simply equals to the inverse of the conic when this conic is full rank. That means that it's a non-degenerate uh, conic. And in this case here, the image of the absolute conic is always full rank because uh, it's defined the intrinsic value of the camera, which is always full rank. That means that the dual of the image of the absolute conic, it always exists. And we can simply uh, get the expression for this omega star by taking the inverse of omega, and that would be equals to k multiply by uh, k transpose over here and this particular expression over here uh, definition of the dual image of an absolute conic it directly follows the definition of the dual of a conic what this means is that the original conics is actually a point conic that is defined by points the dual of this uh, conic would be a conic that is defined by a set of lines that envelopes this particular uh, conic although in this case uh, this is a, a special conic where it contains no real points this means that we cannot observe the physical image of this conic on any images and the dual image of the absolute conic omega star here is also equivalent to the image of the dual absolute conic that lies on the plane of infinity which we denote as q infinity star and this uh, 
simply this this is simply the direct result of a projection on, on this particular uh, uh, quadric on the 3d space by the projection matrix that we have seen earlier on so once the image of the absolute conic omega or equivalently its dual omega star is identified in an image then the intrinsic calibration matrix can be uniquely identified via a Kolesky decomposition. This is because omega star is simply equals to k multiplied by k transpose. We can simply apply a Kolesky factorization on omega star to recover the upper triangular matrix of k. And next, the image circular points lie on omega at the points at which the vanishing line of the plane pi intersects omega. This is because uh, at the plane at infinity, uh, we have this uh, absolute conics, which we denote as uh, omega infinity here. And this plane over here is pi infinity. We know that uh, the vanishing line also lies on this particular plane at infinity, which we denote as L infinity here. And these two points here are the circular point where the uh, intersection of the line at infinity and the absolute conics happens. And the projection of the absolute conics onto the image is denoted by omega. And uh, the vanishing line uh, would also be projected onto the image as the finite vanishing line here. So uh, it's important to note that uh, although we can observe the projection of the infinite line on the image, we cannot observe the projection of the absolute conic as well as the circular points on the image. This is because these are complex numbers. The absolute conic and the circular points are complex numbers and the, its projections onto the image cannot be observed physically. But uh, mathematically, it actually exists there. So uh, we can mathematically express omega as k uh, multiplied by k transpose and the intersection of this vanishing point with this omega over here omega star here it's going to define the projection of the uh, image circular points and we also further see in lecture three that the plane pi intersects at uh, pi infinity in a line and this is the line that intersects uh, omega infinity or the absolute conic. So this is uh, the line at infinity and the back projection of this or the projection of this onto the image is actually a plane. And this particular plane, we can take it as that this particular plane pi intersects the plane at infinity at the line of infinity, L infinity here. Let's look at how the knowledge of the uh, image of absolute conics can be used to def design a simple calibration uh, device to find the intrinsics of a camera. And it turns out that this can be pretty simple. We can easily design a calibration device by simply having three squares, uh, a shape of uh, uh, three squares over here. So this is just uh, three planes where we print out the a black square and uh, paste it on the plane with a white white border. So the important thing is that we must be able to observe these four corner points on the image in order for this uh, calibration to work. By simply do, uh, having these three planes over here, we can actually use it as a calibration device to compute uh, K. Let's see how it's, uh, it's done. One interesting point is that uh, there's no need for each one of this uh, plane to be in any configuration. For example, it need not be uh, uh, it need not be octagonal, but it's important that they are not parallel. If they are placed in a parallel fashion, then we will have simply defeated the purpose because uh, when you place them on a parallel uh, plane, this simply form a one larger plane. Then you wouldn't have three, three independent uh, planes to get the required constraints anymore. But the planes here need not be in any other configuration except for we have to avoid that, uh, placing it in, in a parallel manner.